And now we're going to have a panel that will help us, you know, use some of that expertise to try and see how we get more policy attention and space for cardiovascular disease. So let me invite to come and join me here on stage the members of our panel. So we have Professor Fausto Pinto, who of course uh, opened our event yesterday, a member of the Global Heart Hub's Clinical and Specialist Advisory Panel, the immediate past president and current board member of the World Heart Federation, and the head of the cardiovascular department for the Santa Maria University Hospital in Lisbon. James Kennedy, the Director of Public Affairs for the European Society of Cardiology. I have Professor Knut Bork Jonsson, who we saw yesterday, and um, the Emeritus Professor and Medical Advisor to the World Diabetes Foundation. So please join me. And I also should have Birgit Beger, who is the CEO of the European Heart Network. And the European Heart Network is one of the three founding members of something called EACH. We've been talking about that for two days, and I suddenly realized maybe not everyone knows what that is. It's the European Alliance for Cardiovascular Health, EACH. That's how that's said. So please, come and join me on the panel. That's lovely. We've got some microphones. Please go ahead. I'll be here. So after that really amazing sort of overview from Alan about, wow, the opportunities are there, ministers care about health, with the right messages we can get there. So I'm going to start by asking James. Um, it's actually a recurrent question we've had yesterday as well as today. Cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of death, it's a huge cause of um, morbidity, but we saw from some of the messages yesterday, it's just not getting the investment, the financial uh, approach, the political priority and visibility it needs. Why not? Okay, thank you very much. Well, thankfully the, the answer is a little bit baked into the question there. Um, I think the, the over-reliance on the figure that CBD is the biggest killer uh, has been uh, our downfall. Um, I actually got this question more as a statement in my interview for this job, actually, which was uh, phrased as a statement of, we need to get the message across that CVD is the number one cause of death. And my response, which in hindsight was a little bit cheeky, was, well, you've been doing that for 20 years. How's that been working out? Um, well, I got the job, right? So I'm here. Um, so I, I think part of, it, part of it is that once we say CVD is the number one cause of death, it reduces cardiovascular disease to a purely public health issue. Now, Alan's kind of, kind of alluded to this a little bit already. The problem with that is a surprisingly small number of policymakers have an institutional role in healthcare policy. So if you take the European Parliament for, as, an, as a case study, 9% of MEPs sit on the Environment, Public Health, and Food Safety Committee. Um, so that means 91% of politicians have no role to play at all in healthcare policy. They work on gender equality, regional development, transport, environment, foreign affairs, civil liberties, and so on. So we need to be able to find ways to talk to those people who will never be interested in healthcare policy and make it relevant for them. And this is something which we've been calling a, a cardiovascular health and all policies approach. And I'll, I'll piggyback on Alan's example there of cardiovascular health in women where we've had the most traction. And this has been kind of called the low-hanging fruit, but even the lowest-hanging fruit still needs to be picked. So what we've been doing is going to, to mostly women who sit on the gender equality committees and saying, not, did you know it's the biggest killer, but did you know that cardiovascular disease kills more women than men, and yet only one-third of all clinical trial candidates are women? So we're tailoring treatments for the people who are less likely to need them. Or did you know that 50% of women will wait up to 10 hours before seeking treatment for an obvious sign of a heart disease because we think that cardiovascular disease is a men's issue. Now, those women who are now our supporters are no more interested in healthcare policy than they were before, they, before we met them. But now, they view action on cardiovascular disease as synonymous with a fight that they've been having their whole careers, which is gender equality. And the same can be said for talking to trade unionists about worker safety and exposure and we need action there. And the same can be said for regional development and people concerned about east, west, countryside, city, where we've said things like, you know, if you were born in Denmark today, over the course of your life, you have a 24% chance of dying of cardiovascular disease. If you're born and raised in Bulgaria, that jumps to 75%. So if, you're, if you care about social justice and equality, then you need to support action on cardiovascular disease. I'll give one more, much more out there example. Uh, we found ourselves sitting in front of a Finnish MEP um, who kind of looked at my card and went, 
you're with the European Society of Cardiology and you want to talk to a Finnish MEP on the transport committee about driving licenses. I kind of looked at us to go, are you in the right place? Did you get lost or something? Um, and the message was a bit out there, but clear. You know, this is a woman who's campaigned her whole career on road accidents. And be able to say, did you know that in Finland, 11% of all fatal collisions on the road are due to a medical incident, and out of that, 87% are due to a cardiovascular disease. So people find out they have a heart condition as they're crashing the car, killing themselves and potentially somebody else. And now we have a supporter from the transport committee who couldn't care less about health policy, but recognizes that action on this field is a continuation of that. I think there's a second part to the answer, but I'll leave it there. I could go on with all these examples. Ask me later what cardiovascular disease has to do with fishing and agricultural policy uh, as well. <laughs> yeah, you know, one of, the, uh, one of the things that I do is I often train uh, advocates in preparing messages, and I do something called, which I call the, the cocktail party game, which is I give them one minute and I give them a random topic, like, you know, where you took your last vacation. And they have to, within 60 seconds, start on the random topic, but get to their policy issue within 60 seconds. So it sounds like you do this a lot with your team. because it's a, it's a really, I strongly recommend that. It's a great exercise to do for free, and it's brilliant training. Okay, so you've set out, you know, some of the challenges that we have. So let me now pass to Fausto, and I'm going to come to you, Birgit, as well. What can the cardiovascular community do? How do they come together to try and you know, use the skills that we've just heard about, you know, talking to people about the things they care about, and making the link to cardiovasculars? Well, I could only echo uh, what Alan mentioned, and uh, I think it was a great example on the different areas that we can focus on, of course, with all the experience that uh, somebody like you have, uh, what uh, uh, you just mentioned also. I think the key messages here will be, on one hand, the motto of this meeting, unite. Because, again, I'm a clinician, so I'm, I'm used to deal with patients. Uh, but also, I've been involved in many organizations trying to convey all these messages. And in reality, we have not been very successful. We have been partially successful. I think we're much better now than we were 20 years ago. But still, there's a long road to go, and the, uh, I think the key is to, and that's why it's so important to have patient groups and patient organizations involved. Because when you mention examples, I think the best example is the patient. And also, at some point, it looks like that we are asking for something uh, which is a little bit strange. No, what we are asking here is to promote cardiovascular health which can affect everybody, including the politicians. You know, a prime minister, a minister, I'm sure he has some uh, parent or some people in the family that has a cardiovascular issue. Actually, when politicians have a cardiovascular issue, they come to us clinicians to ask for, you know, what can we do to solve the problem? So we, we have to use basic, this is not a single shot. We have to use all the tools we have available. And I believe more and more, that patient groups, because of all the reasons you mentioned, have here a real role to, to play, a big role to play, together with scientific organizations, with medical organizations, with foundation, you know, with all the stakeholders or all the, the key players uh, in, in, the, in health issues, but in this case in the, uh, in the cardiovascular arena. And that's why it's so important more and more to empower uh, these patient organizations. And I, I'm not saying this because I'm here in this, in this group. Um, actually, it's part of the World Health Federation that uh, we're very much promoting that. But alone, each one of us alone, we will not be as successful as we can be together. When politicians look, and I had this experience several, it was actually mentioned to me. You know, if I go as a clinician, even as a head of uh, a scientific society, I was president of the ESC, I was president of WHF, Politicians look at clinicians with a little bit of suspicion, and we have to be open on this uh, on these things, um, because you know you may always uh, look, you know, is he what is he talking about? Sometimes because we have difficulty in translating uh, some of the messages, in a, in a, in, and that's very important. You know, messages we can say beautiful things, but if these things are not understood by our recipient, then, you know, they're totally useless. And that's, again, why the voice... I was actually 
And that's the reason why I stayed here the whole time. It's very interesting for a clinician to be in this group, listening the way patients, uh, because this is the different type of conversation I have in my office or in my hospital with the patient. And this is so important that we listen to each other and that we work together. So to answer your question, the key is work together to have clear messages, simple messages, I agree, we have to, be, to make it simple, but at the same time to highlight that we are dealing, you know, come on, we are dealing with the number one cause of why people die. Unfortunately, uh, uh, at least half of us here are going to die with heart disease whether we, or cardiovascular disease, whether we like it or not. That's the way it's going to be. And, and the problem is, as somebody mentioned, it's not only about dying. Of course, we all have to die. But it's different if you die when you're 95 years old or when you're 40 or 45. So what we are dealing here is to fight against premature mortality. And as you've mentioned, this goal of uh, SDG to, to uh, reduce by one third in 2030, unfortunately, even before the pandemic, there were only 14 countries that were on track. That there is actually an N N NCD countdown that uh, is monitoring the, how uh, the countries are, uh, are uh, reaching this, this, this target. And I believe now not many more are, are reaching that. Mm -hmm. And probably we're not going uh, we, we, we to miss, miss that target. So unite, work together, scientific community, medical community, uh, patient organizations, and here I want really to highlight the role that patient groups can have to convey the messages in a way that can be listened, I would say, with different ears, if it's just one okay. of the components like the scientific community. Thank you, Fausto. Birgit. Yeah, it is uh, very exciting times, um, indeed, and I think uh, we are, we are uh, sh seeing a shift, um, not always uh, by the, uh, uh, caused by the most uh, nicest circumstances, but uh, with COVID-19, I think uh, CVD has been exposed a lot, uh, CVD patients have been exposed a lot, because they were much more vulnerable, and there is also a general awareness that health is becoming more important for everybody, because it has impacts on economy if people can't go to work, uh, immediately the, the facts are on the table. So I think there's a, a heightened sensitivity uh, towards the topic, so this is an opportunity. And uh, as my two speakers before me said, it is uh, very important to work together. And uh, this, I think it starts with the patients coming from the European Heart Network. We are an umbrella organization bringing together heart foundations and patient organizations uh, across Europe. Uh, so uh, we come together and uh, we thought it is, it is the moment, and so uh, there was the idea to work with each, with the European Alliance of Cardiovascular Health, uh, to bring together um, more expertise. Uh, that means, let's say, uh, the clinicians, so different medical societies, or different patient groups specialized in, in a specific uh, cardiovascular disease, familiar hypercholesterolemia, um, we have stroke community coming together, so it's very important to have these, but we also have the expertise of uh, people working for uh, medical solutions, let's say medical devices, and uh, the pharmaceutical industry, because uh, without the medication, we, we don't achieve it either. And if all this uh, expertise comes together to the policymakers and says, well, we don't have only a problem, we have a solution. If we all come together and uh, we recommend you as a plan, do this, this, and this, primary uh, uh, prevention, secondary prevention, uh, get the diagnosis, early detection right, to change all already a lot uh, of, of, of the landscape of the, of the public health and in the end of the, uh, of the economy. You, that, and that is to be carried forward by patients as a message to see uh, here it is, it's the electorate. You, we are not, patients are not powerless. You are the electorate of the politician. So it is this power you need to be aware of and, uh, and you have a very convincing case. You are authentic and I think it's, it's this message which uh, uh, um, in the end touches politicians and say, wait, I, I have to do something and if I do work on cardiovascular health, I will improve overall uh, the situation in my country in, 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 and in my, my, let's say, political career as well. I will do something good. And I think that is the, the role uh, which we can all uh, play together if we stick together and bring our best forward, best foot forward in, in whatever we, we have as, an, as a skill, as a uh, expertise, as an experience uh, to convince. I think that is, uh, in, in a nutshell, I think what, what we need to do 
and we have to grab the opportunities. If the elections are coming on board, it is high time to get busy, to get, get ourselves together, to have a plan, uh, an advocacy plan, to have a campaign, to work on it, and, um, and we should not, never give up, even if one um, silly motion doesn't go forward. There's always another opportunity, and it is the con uh, continuous uh, working, uh, in German you say, the drilling of thick hard boards continuously, or the drop on the stone. You need, don't give up. You keep on banging on the door, and you will get in. You will get in. That's, that's uh, uh, I think, the idea that um, in working together with a joint expertise and being convincing, having the right messes, messages. We have good resources, it's true. WHO does, WHO does a lot of research, scientific background. You're, you're convincing in that if you bring science and, and uh, personal life together, uh, uh, there's a great road ahead. And with cardiovascular health uh, being, it is killer number one, we can't ignore it. But if you change it around, you would say it's the best way to get your society healthy, what could you achieve if you invested there? So I think that is, it's a positive message also. You, 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 it's also a question of how you message this, but I think there's a lot um, of this speaking in our favor, and uh, we should use this opportunity now. Excellent, thank you. Knud, I saw you were nodding a couple of times there, particularly. Um, let me ask you to, to focus a little bit in what patients can do in this, we've had this strong message about, you know, coming together, collaborating, making sure you've got, you know, a, a sort of coherent message, keep going, there's the drops on the stones that Birgit said. How do you see patients? I see patient and patient organizations as a resource that is far too often not used properly, not utilized in the process. Um, for many good reasons, very often you're not let into the decision-making process. But the disaster is that you would be the only people in a room, if you were allowed in, you would be the only people representing the lived experience with that disease. And that is crucial, uh, because otherwise there will only be advices from clinicians, from researchers, from health economists, from others. We're pretty good at numbers. Uh, we're not very good at lived experience. Um, and for that reason, you need, first of all, to go to the politicians at all level. Start off with the National Board of Health or the Ministry of Health. Bang the doors in, get into these commissions. Uh, I've seen the consequence of that in a number of groups that I've been sitting in in, in Denmark, uh, both where we had the, uh, the National Committee on Diabetes, secondly for the uh, seven years where I was a member of the Danish Medicine Council, which corresponds to NICE in UK, we are making the decisions on which new drugs are allowed to get to the market, which ones are uh, allowed um, to be reimbursed. Uh, that's a very, very tough priority. Um, no subcommittee and none of these meetings would take place without patient representatives being there. They do not always get what they want, but it makes a huge difference to the discussion in the room and you prepare your conclusion in a very different way by having your voice heard in the room. So that is with the politicians. Secondly, with the clinicians and the health policy makers uh, in, at the hostel level, regional level, wherever you are. Again, health professionals will try to do the best we can and do what we think is best for you. The problem is, in the word, what we think is best for you. Just giving you an example, when I did my thesis nearly 40 years ago, uh, I studied patients that have had diabetes for more than 40 years, uh, survived type 1 diabetes for more than 40 years, um, with, the, uh, with the aim to identify what was the difference between the long-term survivors and the rest. As part of the study, I also included a number of open questions where I asked the patients to fill in a full questionnaire. And the most astonishing thing to me in that process was that I asked them, what have you been afraid of uh, during your 40 years or more with diabetes? I believe that just like virtually all other doctors in the world, 
that our patients were afraid of going blind or in ending up in dialysis or having an amputation. That was never on their priority. What they were afraid of was hypoglycemia because that is an acute and unexpected event that takes them out of control and make them dependent on other people. That is what led to the social isolation of, these, uh, of this large group of patients. And that was what have changed their life uh, for 40 or 50 years. That established a whole new line of research in the, in the institution where I was working. Um, and we would never have gone there. We'd never have got there without the input from the patients. And finally, when it comes to the population at large, um, all the, um, all the patient organizations, or the, um, all the large organizations like the Cancer Union, but not least uh, organizations like Red Cross, Medicine Sans Frontier, whoever you're getting out there, how are they making money? They're making money on patient cases, on the stories, of individ on individual stories. You'll always see that as part of their activity. That is where you, as patient organizations, in my view, could learn to a very large extent from what has happened in the fundraising and the raising of the activity around HIV AIDS in the 1990s and early 2000s, what happened in the cancer area and how they suddenly became so dominant in the, in the fundraising area. So um, my message to my colleagues has always been Development is a matter of 90% stealing from somebody else and 10% additional development of your own. And I think you should use that in your organizations as well. Thank you. Thank you, Knud. Uh, James, let me pick up on this because you described these really interesting meetings with MEPs and you used one of the sort of key uh, success factors for advocacy, which is you meet people where they are, in their realities and whatever they do. If you're a Finnish MEP and you care about road transport and road traffic safety, you meet them there. So it's, uh, you've given us these great examples of how you go in with sort of hard facts and crunchy numbers and statistics to help them do that. In those kinds of interactions, how do you see the role of patients? Wh where does the patient story come in that? Oh, it's super easy. Well, you already said it. We, we need a lot of, we have enough stats, we need stories. Um, and we love our stats. Uh, the ESC and every medical society has got, got plenty of these statistics. So you can be armed to the teeth with all the statistics you need to demonstrate that this is a global problem. But there's an expression which has always stuck with me. I have no idea who said it. But it's statistics are people with the tears wiped away. Um, and I think it's not that we need to bring uh, the tears, but it's important because only patients and families of, of, of patients can really do this, which is to go to politicians and say, here is the evidence that this is a global problem. But that's not a percentage point. It's a person. And every single moment that you delay funding screening and diagnosis and treatment and funding cardiovascular health, you reduce another individual's entire unique life experience and their hopes and their dreams and that person. You reduce them to a number on a page. Um, I think only patient organizations and individual patients have the real legitimacy to be able to, to carry that through and, and make that kind of argument. Um, so I think, you know, that it's something which other communities have done very well, is to bring those patient stories, father, uh, stories um, forward in a way which does resonate with people. I think if there's one thing, you know, going back to, to what Alan mentioned about the concrete things and the specifics, I'll get a bit of pushback from this, but the one thing I would recommend when it comes to dealing with politicians, as opposed to dealing with the public, is you need to remove the term raise awareness from your vocabulary when you're trying to develop strategies, uh, because that's where good strategy goes to die. There used to be a, a thing that um, I did with, when training junior consultants, which was whenever they wanted to have a meeting for the first time with a politician, they'd have to have a meeting with me, where I would play the role of policymaker. And they'd learn their lines, and they'd say them in front of the bathroom, and they'd try it in front of their colleagues. They wouldn't even get one sentence in. They'd sit down, and they'd go, hi, my name is, and I'd stop them. And I'd say, I love it. This is the best idea I've ever heard. What can I do to help? And they'd just stand there frozen, 
And they'd recover a bit and go, well, I'd like to raise awareness. And I'd say, I'm fully aware. This is the most important issue I've ever heard of. In fact, I'll rededicate my whole political career to solving this problem for you. What can I do to help? And the lesson is very clear. Unless you know exactly what it is you want the politician to do, you can't take the meeting. Because all that's going to happen is, and I'm sure Alan's had these ones as well, you're going to walk away, that was nice. What a waste of time. I have nothing to do now with that, because politicians also need those policy prescriptions. You know, if you're working on antimicrobial resistance, climate change, emissions trading systems, agricultural policy, regional development, you can't be an expert in everything. So you have to have, you know, not only the convincing argument, but if you are convinced, here is precisely what you can do to help. And that, I think that's something which Global Heart Hub and other patient organizations can provide a very important framework for is when you get those meetings, here's what you need to bring to them. Excellent. I think you've given us, a, again, a reason why we want to develop this manifesto with as, as concrete as possible mechanisms for allies, champions, politicians to do something about it. So thank you for that. Birgit, uh, in your experience, you also work in that European policy space. What's the impact that patient advocates can have in, in the way that they message, in how their, their stories are heard? I think uh, they can have a great impact, and this is growing, and this is also recognized by the institutions. I've been seeing it uh, already for some time with the European Commission, although it's more the administrative public arm. They require uh, patients, for example, to be involved in the European Medicines Agency to uh, give advice on medication, uh, the development, but also the use and the evaluation. So that, I think, is a very institutional step. They say, well, we, uh, as, a, as a regulator, can't work without patients. So there's an institution patients are selected, uh, they get reimbursed, they travel, they become experts. So that is one avenue. I've seen it also in research. Um, again, European Commission says, well, we are having a uh, research project on cardiovascular health, but we need the patient's input. They should be involved before, uh, from the beginning with a research question. What, what should be asked? And what kind of tool is developed? Does it work at all? Is it, is it of help for patients? Is it uh, livable in an in a, in a everyday life? So that is, this is another that I example. And I think this is a growing aspect which patient organizations should exploit and get prepared for so that uh, uh, what you've mentioned, uh, training patient advocates to get the skills to talk, like, like James talks to his uh, junior, junior per personnel in the past, that, uh, that uh, we get skilled and equipped to bring our story forward in, in a sense and, and thus become an integral part of it, a recognized part which is reimbursed, which is paid for the activity and uh, which is also part uh, of the solution which politicians need. They need results, they need a, something, a recommendation, they need a yes and a no, this works, this doesn't work. This is something to be explored. If that tool works, we can uh, apply it in a larger healthcare setting. So I think that is uh, to become an, a part of the big machinery. That is, that is very important. And the justification is there, as we have heard. Uh, it changes completely the outlook. It changes the quality of life of people. And the politicians recognize this, that any kind of investment is useless if patients haven't had their wo uh, voice in it, because does it uh, uh, support quality of life in the end? Is all this investment for usage or not? So I think uh, it, it is, it's, it's a role to be proud about, and uh, I think to follow up also to the opportunities which are there, left, right, and center, to be, to be open to it, and to bring yourself into these committees, become a part of the system. And I think uh, to change the system from with within is much e easier than banging on doors and trying to get into the system. Being already there and being a, a partner at the table, I think that is that what um, is very promising. But even for my organization with the um, uh, European Heart Network uh, to, to participate in this research project, we need to uh, uh, get, get going. We need to mobilize our, our organizations. Hey, don't you have uh, patient advocates? Uh, uh, the, 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 do you have these people? We, we, meet, we, we need to come together to, to get uh, on top of it in order to be able to respond to a public demand which is there. We just need to be prepared and get ourselves ready. Thank you. Uh, Fausto, let me come to you because we've just been hearing um, lots of examples from the European context where the, the, the role of patients in decision making and in setting priorities is acknowledged. There are reserved seats for them, but that's not the case everywhere, and particularly in lower and uh, middle income countries where there may not be the institutional processes and patients have a much harder job 
getting access to it. So what can you share about you know, the realities that you see uh, with your, your hat on with a global perspective? What's the reality on the ground and how can uh, cardiovascular patients in other countries be more effective in their advocacy? Well, that's, that's certainly a very, a very important point. And uh, of course, we witness uh, a lot of uh, disparities, but sometimes even within the same country. Uh, so it's, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a problem that is a, a, a global problem. Some, some countries or some areas are better organized than others. Um, we've seen actually some examples on how to use uh, regional uh, organizations. That's very important. And actually, we have at WHF one program, which are the roadmaps. And the roadmaps, basically, they, they are not guidelines. One of the goals, of course, is to improve implementation of guidelines according with the local needs. But one of the aspects that we develop in these roadmaps is to identify the roadblocks and then work locally. So one of the aspects that I think it's very important is to use local knowledge, to use the, the knowledge from local organizations, either scientific or patient organizations, that can actually understand and help to develop strategies that can be applied in that region, in that country, in that section, whatever. So this is work that, this is a never ending story, of course. And this is work where organizations that are maybe better equipped or better organized can actually help other organizations in other parts of the world to uh, develop their own um, uh, organizations and, and, and also help to shape strategies that can be applied uh, at the local level. And we have several examples of that. Fortunately, in the cardiovascular field, there are across the globe, um, either national or regional organizations. Uh, in Africa, we have PASCAR, we have the Asian Pacific Society in, uh, in Asia. Uh, we have, of course, in the, uh, in, in the Americas, different organizations like SIAC and like, uh, uh, of course, some of the big national societies um, or foundations. And, and here in uh, Europe also, we have, of course, European Heart Network and ESC and many, and many other organizations uh, at the national level that can help to do that. So I would say that we should use the good examples to try to create some sort of a matrix that then has to be adapted to the local circumstances, to the local aspects that have to be taken into account. But let me just say one thing which I think is important. When we are talking about evidence, and that was mentioned, in cardiovascular issues or cardiovascular conditions, I think we have to use emotional evidence. Uh, because one of the differences with cancer, cancer, of course, it's a very important area. It's a very important field. We all know about that. But, um, and yesterday was shown, one of the colleagues showed uh, an, an example on a disparity of the burden of cardiovascular disease and the burden of cancer, and then how it relates with the amount of resources that are uh, put into cancer research or cardiovascular research, or even uh, uh, on cardiovascular health and cancer health. Of course, we are, we, we've never been against promoting and supporting uh, cancer research, very important, but it's a little bit unfair. When we are the number one killers, and whether we like it or not, that's, that's what it is, and actually, we, we, we did uh, some work at ESC a few years ago. And uh, uh, in Europe, public funding was, the difference was six to seven times more for cancer research than for uh, uh, cardiovascular research. And probably now, the, the gap is even uh, more relevant. So we need to use this evidence also in an emotional way, as, uh, as you were mentioning. Because the difference uh, between the perception of the cancer patient and the cardiovascular patient. And this has been a little bit our fault, although I think it's improving, but it's like, you know, for cardiovascular, it's your fault. You deserve it because you don't exercise, you smoke, you eat improperly. While with, uh, uh, with cancer is different, you know, and then always the example of children and that. Uh, and this kind of emotional uh, uh, messages can actually make a big difference in terms of the perception and particularly for the politicians who are very sensitive to this type of message. So we've been working on this for, for a long time, mm -hmm. trying, uh, because children also have cardiovascular disease. And, uh, uh, and we know today that, for instance, uh, uh, obesity is a disease now. Considered. So there are many things that we can try to improve that. And the other comment I would like to make uh, is the importance of having, uh, and it's clear, of course, but having not only politicians involved, but the right politicians. In Europe, we have a great example. We have the Heart Group, which is a, a group of MEPs that are interested in, the, in cardiovascular issues. 
Uh, it's led by a former minister, she's actually Portuguese, for a former minister of uh, higher education uh, in, uh, in, in, in Portugal, and there are a whole set of different uh, uh, MPs that are interested in this topic. The reason why the cardiovascular health plan is now being uh, discussed in the European Parliament has to do with, of course, there's a lot of lobbying, a lot of uh, pushing by, but I would say that the main reason was because these politicians understood and took it to the, to, to the European Parliament. Uh, um, and that's why this translation of science into policy, it can only work in a proper way or efficient way if we can engage and involve the right politicians, saying this, you know, it may sound a little bit funny, but the reality is that you have politicians that can be engaged also uh, in the process. They're going to be our defenders, which is also their defenders, because basically this is a problem of all of us. It's not our problem as cardiovascular community. It's a problem of the whole population. But we need to have proper voices that can understand that. And that can, of course, translate that into reality, because again, we can talk whatever we want. We can hear, we are all converted, so you know, we all understand this. But if we cannot reach out to a level that things can be translated in real action, then yep. we have not reached our, uh, our goal. Excellent. I'm just letting you know that I'm going to have one more intervention from the panel, then I'm coming to you for questions and ideas and responses. Kundu, you also work at a global level, so what's your perspective? First of all, we need to remember that the only reason why we are talking non-communicable diseases, including cardiovascular disease, in low- and middle-income countries is a medical success. What does that mean? When I graduated 40 years ago, uh, or a little more, um, the dominating problem in third-world countries was infectious diseases. Children died, uh, women died during labor, and life expectancy was so low uh, that the majority never developed cardiovascular disease. Today, the infant mortality is extremely low compared to where it used to be. The same with mater uh, maternal mortality. So, the longevity, suddenly we're seeing an increase in the age and, and a large aging population throughout the world. And that is why we are seeing non-communicable diseases. The problem is that that fact has been, to a very large um, extent, been ignored by local governments and by donors. The local governments are still stuck with very restricted budgets and still fight with the infectious diseases that are still left and are still challenging the countries. And they are heavily dependent on external funding. In a number of countries, 40 to 50% of total healthcare costs are covered by external donors. So it's not under governmental control. Donors typically are linked to specific diseases or specific organizations that have a specific interest. And that defines where the money are going. So according to the WHO, out of the donor money going into the countries, only one to two percent are going into non-communicable diseases, which is totally disproportionate um, um, relevant to the disease pattern of the countries. If that is to be changed, that has to be changed also by putting pressure on the donor societies because they have such an enormous influence on what happens in, in the countries. Um, and on top of that, we're then very often facing a situation where patient organizations are either non-existent or very weak in the countries um, that um, also my own organization is, uh, is working in. So part of what we're doing is very often to uh, start by running small projects together with, um, with pioneers in the area and as part of that, uh, supporting the establishment of local patient organizations. Because that is then 
the link, our link into the country is always through the government. Um, it is never only through other organizations. It's always through the government, but building um, civil organizations as well. And I think that is the way to do it. It is not going to be a, a quick fix. It is going to be a very long journey through that process. But in my view, that is the only way to be able to put pressure on the system and, and make a long-term change in the system. Thank you. Thank you. Just pop it down there. I'm, I'm now going to open the floor, but I'm, I'm going to su I've got the feeling it's the day three morning blues, and I feel the energy is a bit low. So I'm going to suggest a quick energizer before I come over to you to, um, to have some questions. So let's everyone stand up just for a second. And yesterday we did the Mexican wave. Today we're going to do something slightly different. We're going to do a clapping game, OK? So I will, I will make a clap. I give it to you. You clap it back to me, and we'll, we'll go through that. You understand how that works? OK, are we ready? <laughs> Up high. Down low. This side. Careful, it's changed now. Let's do it all, all the way around the clock fast. Change ways, other way. Great, thank you. Sit down. You should all feel more, more alive. Much better, okay? Yeah. So now is the time when I come to you. We've had a great panel, some suggestions on what's the role of patients and how do they do it. What would you like to know? What questions would you like to have or experience? Yes, Bumba, go ahead. Thank you. Um, these mics are low. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, hi, there you go. Um, so my name is Bumba. I'm from, uh, I'm based in Boston, but also I'm from um, Mali and Senegal, which is in Africa. Um, so I have, a, I think, a reaction and a comment. So, Great. Um, so as we were speaking, I think I'm, I'm, I'm sad that he left, but also, um, as we were speaking, I thought of a few events, um, like the elections are coming up, so we have polls. Um, the previous ones were kind of wrong, especially in the US. Um, I also went back to the e Ebola crisis, where yep. there was prediction of basically half of Africa dying. And then there was a similar case with the COVID. Um, so I always get, um, and then there was a different case when we talk about LMIs. Um, countries or democracy dictatorship. I think we need to have a little bit more nuanced conversation on those. Um, I can give you an example. We can consider Rwanda a, a, a dictatorship, but it's one of the most advanced in terms of public health right now where they're really training people on global health. Um, so maybe democracy, um, maybe the words need to change there or the narrative need to change. Talking about LMI countries, I'm from the US, I'm in Boston, best hospitals in, you know, in the world. But some zip code don't have any infrastructure. The life expectancy is just in the city itself, not even outside. So okay. I think um, as this, um, to the scientific world and maybe how we translate the data, or we collect the data, translate them into narratives, um, we need to kind of work around that and maybe think about some of the data that has been collected and how they're being collected and then um, um, and translated those words. And talking about an example of using that, we can say 80% of, um, uh, of date of um, heart disease is avoidable. In many of our cases, we are born with this. It's congenital. So in my case, I really, that number has no meaning, right? It's 100% okay. for me. And it affects everybody else. So I think um, maybe like demonstrating some of those inclusive um, narrative would be helpful. Um, okay. The other comment I wanted to make is, Maybe, I mean, we have a lot of institutions in place, and there's probably going to be more, and then our question organization will become institutions So I feel like there's a lot of chef in the kitchen, but how about um, the current institution also innovating? So for instance, some of your institution maybe could seek part, patient organization to come to you, because for us it's hard. You have to do all this work, then you have to find a door to knock to. There's so many doors. So where do you start? The government? This. So okay. then it becomes a personal network, and all of that. I think there should be more of more partnership, but also more inclusion of the patient organizations within those institutions. So okay. those were my reactions and my comments. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. They're, they're not questions, they're just comments. That's lovely. Can I just have a very short comment on uh, yes. 
I think what you mentioned is very important, and, and that's why organizations such as WHF, ESC, and many other, IDF, you know, many other organizations now are working, because this didn't happen some years ago, but that's why now we are including patient groups into the organization. So just to give an example, WHF, in the, in the last couple of years, we have quite a substantial number of patient organizations, including uh, uh, Global Heart Health, to be part of uh, WHF. As ESC has now a, a, a patient group, actually started in my time as, as president, was the first embryo, and now it's growing. And that is, uh, I know in the US the same. But uh, uh, it's clear now that the organizations feel this. And, and, and I think this message is important for you to understand, you know, because this was different. I've been involved in this business for many years, and this did not exist 15 years ago, 10 years ago, that's when it really started. And now it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I think, of course, there's a lot to improve, but there is action. So, to, and, and this is very important for you to understand and to make sure that we continue to work together to expand uh, this type of collaboration. Thank you. Yes. Um, Linda, Linda Warakata from um, Her Heart Australia. Can I just say this has been an amazing session. As somebody who boost, bootstrapped their um, not-for-profit, we've obviously got a huge range here from um, smaller not-for-profits through to very significant ones. Um, so, first of all, James, I just loved your remove raising awareness. That's something so practical, absolutely, you know. We need to be speaking the same language as these people um, when we go to politicians and also having ready those tangible outcomes. So I just wanted to say that was really powerful. There's been so much with all of them, so I mean, I'm not gonna be able to quote all, but also, um, Professor Nutt, uh, honestly, what a great um, quote, steal 90% from other organizations and 10% for your own. And it reminded me of when I actually set up Her Heart, I looked at the research and there was 26 women's cancer charities in Australia. There wasn't one for heart disease. And um, I just went around and interviewed all these women, all these founders, what had they done, what had worked well, and what rabbit holes did they go down that they wouldn't you know, suggest that I do the same. So I think we really need to look at you know, learning from others, translating from other um, different areas, and James, you also gave some great examples, and we didn't hear about the fishing, which I'm sure is very interesting, but I think it's really important that we um, look at how we can really work together and learn from different groups because it yeah so just a, a real shout out to say this has been a great session Thanks. excellent thank you yes selena at the back and then we'll come to you thank you selena gore with women heart um we we spent a lot of time thinking about the policy actions that we would like politicians and legislators to take but oftentimes what some of the biggest actions necessary happen outside of the realm of health, right? Agriculture, commerce. We need folks to be um, to to not be as inundated with marketing from ultra processed foods, for example. So m my question to the panel is: What examples or experiences maybe could you share with us that uh, where you have engaged outside of the realm of health? to help us think about how we might do that in our own countries. I know we've, we, we have good examples in, in, in different settings, but I, I would love to hear as a, in relation to heart health in particular. Thank you. Excellent. Panel, who wants to pick up on that? Maybe, maybe I can start and then the colleagues will... Uh, well, at the, and, and I'm going to give the example of WHF, where we have several uh, expert groups in different fields, some of them um, like, uh, um, for instance, climate change and uh, air pollution, which is an area that now is becoming more uh, and more relevant. And we've been uh, not only promoting some initiatives, but also uh, getting some evidence and, uh, and some um, documents that then can be used in this type of uh, exchange. And uh, there's a document that was published a, a year ago that focused specifically on air pollution, the impact of air pollution and uh, climate change in, the, in cardiovascular conditions. Um, we also working uh, uh, with some organizations, and we produced, for instance, on the trans fat. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, uh, nutrition and areas related with, uh, uh, with food processing. And so that's an area where we also have been uh, producing some 
uh, information and some documents and exercising some advocacy, if you will, in that regard. Uh, some are a little bit more focused on some specific uh, issues or conditions. We just published uh, a, a global document on uh, um, the management of amyloidosis, which is a very hot topic now because now we have some treatment uh, for, this, uh, for this condition. So again, early diagnosis, early treatment, it's, uh, it's key. Of course, on tobacco, on, so there are many initiatives that, and all, all the organizations basically are doing something about that. Um, in terms of not only the, let's say, some of the obvious areas, but also uh, reaching out and, and developing strategies in some new areas. And I think, for instance, the example of air pollution and climate change, which is now a big, uh, a big topic in, uh, in not only in cardiovascular, of course, but particularly uh, in our field that many organizations now are focusing. So it's not only about, let's say, the, the usual hypertension, diabetes, cholesterol, which is, of course, very important, but also other areas that we are also working uh, very closely and developing expert groups to, uh, to work specifically on these topics to alert also to, to, uh, to, to those examples. Excellent. Thank you. Birgit, you wanted to speak? Yeah, maybe just to add on. So there's, there's a, a wide range of tools you can apply, uh, and EHN has been involved a long time in food labeling, as an example, and also something which is close to my heart and interesting for politicians as well as tax. So if you're talking about sugar tax, putting uh, lobbying your politicians to put uh, tax on sugar, to, uh, putting uh, tax on tobacco, uh, it's amazing what you could be uh, achieving as a revenue for the, for the country, which could then be reinvested in health. Imagine that. Uh, uh, that would be amazing. So there are a lot of tools outside health which can help to, to make health more healthy uh, uh, and in, in, in the end become a win-win situation. But you need to be a little bit creative. Uh, think about, and it go, can go very far. Uh, so if you say just food labeling, forcing food companies to change their food, it's called reformulation, so that there's less salt, less fat, less sugar in it. Having uh, vending machines in schools that the, the products in there are healthy. So these are a lot of examples where, where it goes far uh, if, if you apply them and um, make, make, make it as a concrete recommendation, we were talking about a concrete next steps to take it on. Um, uh, and, and you need to be creative, but there, there's a lot to do, and uh, it can be very efficient. James. Um, in terms of areas outside of healthcare policy, this gives me a chance to go back to my agriculture one. Here's going to be something that's really going to annoy any EU taxpayer here today, which is, did you know that you're spending 200 million euro funding tobacco farming in the EU today? A lot of it in Portugal, by the way. Um, so, you know, that's something which is an obvious example where, unless you've read the, as I have, the 400 pages of the common agricultural policy, why would you know that? You know, why would you be able to do that? The problem with prevention policy and getting outside of these areas is it's really hard. It's very technical. Understanding about chemicals and polycyclic hydrocarbons and exposure rates and different things, that's really difficult stuff and requires a lot of expertise in different areas. So, you know, I think that's something which we're going to have to address at some point, and we've actually had the feedback from the European Commission recently, which is we want more organizations in healthcare to get involved in environmental policy and other aspects like this and employment policy, because we're only hearing from green groups and employers' organizations and things like this. To give a concrete example of something which I think is, is working uh, outside the healthcare policy area is on the driving side of things, for example, we've uh, tried to include in the latest legislation that uh, for medical fitness to drive, there should be a cardiovascular test. Uh, when you first get your license and when you get it renewed. Now, I don't particularly care about the driving side of things. I just wanted the Trojan horse in screening and diagnosis. But it's an example of how you can go a little bit outside that scope uh, to do it. And the one thing I would caution when it comes to uh, the prevention side of things as well is what I often feel is lacking is proper case studies to be able to give to politicians to say to fund. Um, because it's very easy for policymakers to dismiss the prevention side of things because it gives them a really easy way out, which is, oh, well, that's great. Don't eat too much, don't drink, and don't smoke. Job done, thank you very much. And they, they don't need to invest money. They don't need to actually do things to, 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 um, to pass and to, to invest. So I just say, when pushing for major action on prevention, always have something that you're asking politicians to invest in and don't give them the easy pass of passing it off just to the individual as an individual or libertarian responsibility. Thank you. Hello, my name is Hyvel. I'm from Heart Sisters. Um, okay, heart disease is the number one killer of women. We all know that. But do you know that black women, African American women, women of color, are three times more likely to die of heart disease than any other race? 45% are living with heart disease. 
and 30% are more likely to die. Black women are dying of maternal rape more than any other nation in this world, which is baffling to me. And my question to you guys is, I am a micro organization and our voices are not being heard. I tell my ladies when I go into my communities, no one's coming to our rescue. I'm here, I thank Neil and the organization for having me here, but it's time for a change. How do I help my community? Thank you, excellent question. <laughs> Who on the panel can respond faster? Well, I, I, what I can say is that, well, this is something that we really have not only to, to know, to understand, to have the evidence, and these numbers are very dramatic, um, but also to react to this, as you, as you said. And actually, many organizations uh, in the cardiovascular field uh, have been creating even some groups reflecting and trying to develop strategies to tackle this issue of cardiovascular health in uh, women. Um, WHF again has been do working with the, in that field, ESG is doing the same. We actually used to have a group of uh, cardiovascular health in, uh, uh, in women. ACC, for instance, and AJ also developing, and there have been a couple of recent documents, particularly focusing on issues related with cardiovascular, uh, 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 on, on all the cardiovascular issues in, uh, in women. But again, as was mentioned before, this can only have an impact if it translates at the local level. It can only have an impact if we can work, again, together, but also with the local, uh, and when I mean local, it can be national or regional, uh, uh, institutions and organizations and, again, decision makers to translate what we know into policies that can actually uh, minimize the impact that uh, these realities uh, currently have. And to change that, you know, this is not going to happen overnight. First of all, we have to acknowledge, that's obvious, and it's true that awareness sometimes it's, but this is important to be repeated. It's important to be repeated at different levels. Uh, we know this, and all of us here know this, but we can only change if we can reach out to a level where some measures have to be taken and strategies that can have proper implications on the ground and make that happen. But that's why it's so important to have the pressure by organizations uh, such as our organizations to work together to make sure that this reality is shown and then, of course, develop what are the main aspects that need to be changed. Of course, many of them you cannot change overnight, but certainly uh, if you don't develop that strategy, then in a few years we will continue to have this conversation. And that's why it's so important that, again, we work together to tackle this. Good. Yes, I agree. And uh, just to follow up on it, um, of course, I cannot reply specifically to what it is like in, in your community. but. Um, we heard earlier on that uh, stop, stop talking about awareness. This is, however, one of the few areas where I would say we need awareness and we need the data. Um, because data is a prerequisite for, uh, for action. And these data need to be shared in a pretty confrontatory way, both with local decision makers in the, uh, in the community and also with the health professionals asking the question, this is the reality, what are you going to do about it? Um, because the people responsible for the healthcare system, including prevention, um, will need to come up with the answer. And then the, the answer to that would be, don't stop until you have the answer. Uh, it sounds easy, it's not going to be easy, but it, in my view, it's the only way. For me, the question, thank you very much, is, is the question also a bit about female leadership uh, in the end, to get women, like, like we have I discussed with patients, they need to be at the table and in order to, in, within the system to influence the system. So I think it's a question of lead, uh, female leadership to be on panels, to be in the board. For example, World Heart Federation has now more um, women on the board. This is their, uh, very decisive steps, and it's the, the gender equality. And I, I think only this way, uh, being a part of the table, 
table, you might be uh, able to change the situation uh, in your local community. And this is maybe to look about uh, the Australian colleague from her heart to see how she did it, how she can help uh, to, to uh, break, uh, break the wall there. Uh, so that is, would be um, my advice at this point. But it's, it's, it's not your own, own, <laughs> own problem only. I think it's, it's overall uh, uh, to, to increase the participation of women in, in decision making. Thank you. And just before I hand over, I'm going to take my moderator hat off for two seconds to say on Monday, before I flew here, I moderated an all day event on racism and discrimination in healthcare. So I have a lot of details of organizations, particularly UN bodies, that are looking at from a discrimination and equality lens. So find me in the coffee break and I will give you those details. Neil. So Tamsin, um, not a question, but uh, two, two observations. Firstly, I think this has been a superb discussion, and unfortunately, Alan isn't here. He's gone to check out of his room. Um, I want to thank all the speakers, because this has been really inspiring. Alan mentioned that, and we, we saw from his presentation, he's a man of significant political experience. He's working with the G7, G20 health ministries. And you all heard him say that his conversation with Linda was the first time he had heard about this issue of women and heart disease. To me, that is jaw-dropping, okay? And to pick up from Havel's um, point, I think we've got to the point, and, and Knut, you talked about, you know, we need the evidence. We have the evidence. There isn't only inequality, there's discrimination. And uh, I think the time is now right, particularly as we move to elections to actually make this. The gender issue in cardiovascular disease is huge. And uh, I'm delighted to say that within Global Hub, we have a number of patient organizations whose sole mission uh, is the gender issue uh, in cardiovascular disease. And they are now uniting, and hopefully under the Global Hub, we will have an international voice of patients, which I think is, is very important. So I just wanted to say that. And the second thing, uh, not you made the, um, the uh, reference to the insight gained uh, during your research, patient insight about what was important uh, to patients. And I think that under, underpins the value of patient insight and speaking to patients. And I just want to give you an example from a fundraising uh, perspective, which shows you the importance of speaking to the end user. So some of you, or maybe all of you, will, will know of RNLI, the lifeboats. And some years ago, uh, they were realizing that their donations to the lifeboat uh, organization was decreasing. So they decided to go out and speak to the donors now, they assumed that the donors were supporting the lifeboats because they were saving lives. They were, they were launching in treacherous weather conditions to save lives. They discovered that the donors were not interested in the rich kids, typically, who fell off the luxury yachts. They were supporting the ordinary man and woman who was the volunteer who was putting their life at risk by going into the boats. So the RNLI launched a campaign where they literally got a volunteer, and without him knowing it, they threw a bucket of cold water over him. They captured that moment, and that became their, their ad, their appeal, support these guys, and their donations rocketed. Point being that you need to talk to the end user, and that's why it's so important that there are fora like this where patient insight uh, is gathered. Just two, two comments. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Hello. Hi. Um, I'm Paula Warren from BHS. Um, I've, um, I'm a patient. Um, I had a stroke in 2010, and then I had heart failure diagnosed in 2000. Um, and my family told me not to mention it. And lots of friends said the same. I was single at the time. I was 40 years of age. And they just said, this is totally uncool. Uh, it's totally uncool and also you're, you're going to affect your job, you're going to affect everything. What's really interesting is that if I'd said I had cancer, I would have had a very different response. Uh, and I sort of wanted to direct um, the question really to James, is how do you get rid of the fact that it is not sexy to have a heart attack? 
Um, because it, I'm not saying that it's sexy to have uh, uh, cancer, but the perception is um, that that's an okay disease and you'll get support. Um, and what I've found is that when I try and find any influencers, like sort of with regards to social media, etc., it's nearly impossible to find out that anyone famous has had a heart attack or had heart failure uh, because they're told to shut up. And their agents are told exactly the same because it is uncool. And, and yet, how many famous people have we heard of that have cancer? How do we change that perception at that level? That's a tough one. Um, I mean, I, and, and, and you're not allowed to use the word raise awareness. That's fine. That's uh, not allowed. I mean, I think that's going to be a slow process. I mean, part of it is in, I hesitate to use the word branding here, but, but let's say how the cancer community has positioned a lot of the issues that they have. I mean, has anyone ever heard that someone is losing a long, slow, painful, agonizing battle with mitral regurgitation? But everybody can say the same about cancer, right? That, that it's a battle and it's a force, and, and there's a huge journey that goes with it that is often presented, which I think has just been played out by these, by these patient stories as well. Um, the only part that I would have to show about it, and I have to admit, even, you know, it was only since joining the ESC that I realized the extent by which patients go through and what also what end of life looks like for someone suffering from cardiovascular disease and palliative care and CVD versus, these were totally unknown to me until I joined. Um, and I think, you know, maybe not necessarily awareness, but certainly those stories need to be put out there because that's going to be a slow process. So I don't think there's any quick fix to that. Uh, but I think the more and more we're putting patient stories out there about what it's actually like, the more you're going to get that culture shift. In the same, exactly the same way that other major culture shifts have started, for example, with mental health, where just more and more people talking about their stories has gradually, glacially, slowly, started to shift perceptions in different countries on that as well. Good. Yeah, and exactly the mental health what was I would like to follow up on. Uh, mental health has, even more than cardiovascular disease, been a disease where you don't talk about uh, you have it. What really changed the situation in Denmark was when the former prime minister's daughter died uh, from suicide. Uh, she was schizophrenic. He has spent the rest of his life on um, uh, working on improving conditions for um, mentally ill uh, patients uh, and really put pressure on the political system. Um, having somebody of that character to go out and open the scene makes it much easier for the next number of people uh, to do the same. And it suddenly becomes something that you can speak about publicly. So um, <laughs> I'd almost say I'd encourage um, um, organizations to try to identify daring politicians or daring leaders from big companies that would dare to go out and tell their own story. Um, there are other stories, examples from the history. Tito went out and said he had diabetes. Uh, Nasser went out and said he had diabetes. Uh, and that made a difference in both those countries. Okay, thank you. Yeah, just to Thank highlight you. patients' voices, it's crucial. We don't need everybody to come up, but we need people that can have an influence. And those are either politicians, uh, public figures, and there are some willing to do that. Maybe not as many as with cancer, but uh, that is, and, and actually some organizations already are working on that and trying to improve that. But again, I think that's gonna be one of the roles of mm -hmm. patient uh, organizations is to get the, the most out of uh, public voices that can, and particularly public figures that can com come up and present their case so we can actually work. And again, this is, gonna, th this is a long road. This is not a, a short one. And, and this is not a, a situation that you are alone in dealing with. I, I ran a, a workshop with a group of uh, COPD patients that's chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which 95% 95, 95 of people who get that's because they've been smoking. So clearly there's no sympathy out there for anyone with COPD. And they would, we had exactly the same conversation. And there's a very well-known supermodel who has this disease as a result of her smoking. She's absolutely refused to come out publicly and be their campaigners because they've been trying to get her to speak publicly for a number of years. They have a very similar problem. And the only suggestion that came out of their, their network, and using this idea, you steal 90% from other people, I'll share it with you. The, 
the, the work of the patient organization at slowly trying to remove some of the stigma is designed to make the space a little bit safer for a public figure to come out. So it's, it's, it's the two things that needed to work together. So that's the advice that was shared in that group. I've, I'm giving you all a time check. I've got eight minutes left, and I've got two speakers, three speakers who want, who want to go. Great, just checking. Go ahead, and then we'll go at the back. James, are you uh, happy to do a little role play based upon your uh, anecdote about, uh, uh, about talking to your first time advocates when they're going to meet a politician? Yeah, it kind of depends what you have in mind, but uh, yeah, sure, I'll Well, let's, let's bring it on you and see what happens. Okay. Hello, James, I'm Paul. How you doing, Paul? Nice time for coming in. Well, um, you're a relatively new employee of the ESC, and were you informed about some of the work of the ESC Patient Forum during your, uh, your induction process, particularly on um, their work on cardiovascular health with women, uh, mental health and uh, in, for cardiovascular patients, and the role of digital medicine in cardiovascular medicine? Uh, to some extent, like all things with the ESC, I'm discovering new systems and new places every single day, it seems. Uh, but with the patient forum, uh, I think I had my first meeting with the patient forum only, not, only a couple of months ago, but I was, I was blown away by the things that I never would have thought of in a, in a million years I would discover. But I'm aware of two of those groups, not the third. That's wonderful. Um, one of the th things I want to actually talk to you about is a real problem that I think the ESC patient forum has. And that is that there are about 50 members of the ESC Patient Forum currently, but they do not represent the full multicultural complexion of the European population. There are large numbers of people from BAME communities, for example, and other marginalized communities in Europe at the moment. Um, and they are not represented on the Patient Forum. What can you do to redress that balance? Uh, Paul, I think you know the answer is going to be, I can talk to my colleague Inga about it on the patient forum <laughs> and bring this to your attention, but I think you know I'm not going to uh, come out for the ESC on, on all those fronts, but all I can do is agree with you and think that that's important to reflect, but I mean, let's uh, take that conversation uh, back inside and, uh, and work on it. Thank you for raising my awareness. I'm Paul. <laughs> thank, thank you. Uh, Hard to follow up with that, Paul, but I mean, uh, you know, just thinking about the, that and the previous speaker, I mean, Neil, we have an opportunity here. There's a lot of good-looking people in this room. Let's make cardiovascular disease sexy. Let's launch a campaign. Um, <laughs> let's do it. I, I think about, and just for some quick context, I think about you are all leaders in your organizations, respectively, and thank you for that. And we have parallel organizations. My name is Mark Baines. I'm from Canada. I think about uh, European Society of Cardiology, we have the Canadian Cardiovascular Society. European Heart Network, we have the Canadian Heart Failure Society. World Diabetes, we have Diabetes Canada. Of course, World Heart Federation is in its realm. And in the lack of, I would just say, uh, patients on this panel, in terms of catalyzing patient advocacy, how do your respective organizations catalyze patient advocacy some real-world examples that I can take back and organizations like my colleagues in Mexico, my colleagues in the U.S. can take back and say, hey, Canadian Heart Failure Society, hey, Canadian Cardiovascular Society, here's what is happening across the globe. Here's how to integrate patient partners and catalyze their voices. So it would be great if I could hear from each one of you on how you respectively bring in the patient voice into your organizations and create change. Excellent. B before we respond, let's just take the last question, then we'll wrap the panel up. Yes. So um, we've been talking about um, how do we, you know, why, why is um, cardiovascular disease not um, uh, getting the uh, funding um, which, which is compatible with, you know, with cancer and what have you. Um, we've been talking about confrontation. We've been talking about um, being able to link um, cardiovascular disease with something that is important. We've been talking about motivation. How do you get a politician to change? Um, the, the simple reason why cardiovascular disease is not at the top, even though it's the major killer, is age. And the vast majority of people who get it, although young people do get it, the vast majority are much older and they're retired. If you had cardiovascular disease affecting the 30 to 50 age group, 
it would, it would change. It would not be the number two. It would be at the top. So how do you put that to the politicians? So you have to be confrontational. So, and, and we discussed this in Brussels, um, and the um, term discrimination was brought up, and it is age discrimination. Okay. Um, so maybe we need to think about that. Thank you for that. So you're going to respond to those two interventions, each of you. So I'll start here, Birgit, and we'll work our way across the panel. Yeah, thank you for the question with the, with the patient organization. I mean, each and, uh, considers itself as a patient organization, and we have a, a bit of a mix because we also have foundations. We will work closely with uh, patient organizations. But my recipe is really uh, that uh, patient organizations, they need a, uh, a seat in, in a governance, in the structure. So in, on the board of organizations, of entities, of agencies, they need to, to, to be an integrated part, and that is, I think, the best and um, surest way. Uh, it's financed, it's planned, it's, it's structured, and that way the influence is, is guaranteed. Um, that's that's my my my, uh, my understanding. What what I also saw in oncology, I've worked for an oncology organization, and they made it part of the governance structure statutes that the the um, uh, the, the chair of the patient uh, organizations committee that was part of the board meeting was vice chair of the congress, and, and and that's that's the way it works. It needs to be financed and structured and planned. Otherwise, it becomes wishy washy and not real. I think that's that's it, re real facts. And regarding the age discrimination. It is true, but it's also a little bit not true, and that is part of what makes uh, also the, the understanding of, of the issue difficult, because there are young people who are dying of, 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 of heart disease. We have the soccer player in, 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 in Copenhagen who almost dropped that, he had three uh, medical uh, the doctors around him, then they managed just to save his life because the, the clinic was very close. So there are people born with uh, congenital heart disease, and they die early. So, um, and I think we should use these examples but bring it in all together. It's, we have to show the whole picture of cardiovascular, all the different conditions. It's not just the, the heart attack. We have uh, uh, cholesterol, uh, familial hypercholesterolemia. We have uh, uh, um, um, the, also, and also the link to other diseases, diabetes, kidney failure, cancer. I think uh, we, we need to be aware how central uh, heart disease is and make, uh, make that uh, uh, seen and uh, through voices for, of patients. And I think then uh, uh, it becomes uh, less, uh, it becomes obvious that you need to, do, need to do something about it. And because it's urgent, it's just very, very urgent. And it doesn't restrict to a certain group of uh, people, certain gender, a certain uh, uh, place where you were born, uh, administration where you live in, uh, east or west, north or south, it concerns everybody. And I think this is the message uh, which needs to drop. Thank Go you. Ahead. Unfortunately, that soccer player uh, made it and was playing for Manchester United yesterday. Uh, so. <laughs> Wonderful, but that's a success that's, story. That's great. That's yep. a success story. That's a success it's, it's, it's story. But it's also a, a vulnerability. I just start off uh, apologising because I think I said that we need more research. That was not what I meant. I meant that there is a lot of knowledge out there. We need to use it. Uh, and we need you to use that together with us. Then um, the take-home the take uh, message uh, for the organizations is, in my view, again, to seek influence, to unite. Uh, to unite not only between you as different organizations, but also to unite with, the, with other organizations, being it medical organization, uh, health professional organizations, or universities, trying to uh, open the door even for the patients' organizations to be a part of those making decisions on both the future of research, the allocation of research, research resources, and to a large extent also individual research projects. That is an increasing trend throughout the world mm -hmm. that um, researchers want to, um, to, to, to join forces with individual patients and patient organizations. So try to use that possibility as well. And then about age discrimination, um, I agree to a very large extent. Um, and when it comes to prioritizing resources, that is one of the places where health economics breaks down. 
Um, that is why when it came to the Danish Committee on the, the Danish Medicine Councils, we were, for instance, not allowed to use the so-called quality, quality adjusted life years, because that will automatically discriminate against age, uh, because you no longer have an income. You're no longer a positive income to the society. Um, so we were not allowed to do that, uh, and that actually changed some of our decisions. It gave a lot of problems when it was very expensive medications for very, very young children. Um, but uh, we had to live with that. Thank you. Okay. James and Fausto, your challenge is to have just one minute each, because you are the only thing standing between the audience and coffee. Okay. Uh, I'll, do, I'll do my best. So, so first off to the issue of, of the patient involvement within the institution. So uh, we're not great getting better. Um, one of the most obvious things to me not that long ago was uh, we had a, a major piece of policy that we're working on at the moment, and we said, well, we need to consult with our patient form. And then we took a step back and went, well, hang on a second, we don't have any patients on our advocacy committee. Maybe that would be a good start. So now, instead of just asking patients kind of what they think, let's just give them the pen and say, you know, write it down. Put it, put it in paper and, you know, and, and do it uh, the way we're doing it now. The second part on age discrimination. I think the easiest way to test this is um, how many people have heard some variation of the phrase during COVID, it's only older people who are dying, or it's mostly older people who are dying. Now imagine, take that phrase and replace it with what in the United States would be considered a protected class. It's only women who are dying. It's only LGBTQ people who are dying. Can you imagine the immediate, even the room is tense just now, imagine the social backlash that that would get. But somewhere along the line, we gave off the impression that a life is less valuable just because it's been lived a little bit longer. Um, you know, and also a part of that is even you know, a sinister use of the term premature death. I had this pushback at a meeting in the European Parliament not long ago where I gave some of the statistics and they said, yeah, but how many of those are premature deaths? And I fumbled the answer and I walked away afterwards going, that's messed up. And I thought, hang on a second, you know, my son two weeks ago turned two years old at the same time that my father turned 83. Now, am I supposed to feel better if my father dies of cardiovascular disease at 84? Am I supposed to feel that that's less tragic? I'm supposed to turn around and say, well, he had a good run? No, obviously not. Um, so I think you know, the, the, the issue of age-related cardiovascular diseases is considerably more sinister because it's not that we have a lack of awareness of them. We have an acceptance of symptoms of heart disease as a natural part of getting older that you would never see with anything else. You would never see someone say, I've got lower back pain, jaundice, sudden weight loss, that person's getting old but you can have someone perfectly describe the symptoms of heart disease and then wave it away as they're getting old. So that's a social issue that needs to be addressed. I know that wasn't one minute. <laughs> that was more than one minute. So it was, <laughs> apologies. No, I'm gonna be very short. For, for the first question of Mark, well, I think it's a good example on an organization such as WHF is supporting uh, patient organizations and how much we are voicing and giving the voice to patient groups, which actually are a big part now of uh, the World Health Federation. And by the way, and I was talking with a, a couple of people here. Next, next year, there's going to be election for the, for the board of WHF. And now being a member, you know, all the patient organizations being members of uh, uh, WHF, they can apply, you know, individually, they can apply for being uh, board members of the World Health Federation. We're more than welcome. And uh, <clears throat> I, I think that's a way to, to be more involved with, uh, with the organization. Age discrimination. It's a misperception. You know, if, if I take you to my CCU or to my ward, um, more, sometimes more than half of the patients are less than 60 years old or even 50 years old. So uh, uh, that's a perception which is not correct. And we have to, to, you know, of course we know there's a relation with age. But we know today that now we see more and more. I've done angioplasty in the 30-year-olds, in the 40-year-olds. So that's not correct. And we have to, to say that, you know, it's, uh, uh, that's, that's the perception. Yeah. Well, that's the perception, and, and is a misperception. The other thing is that we have also to, to take advantage. Now we have a big field in, in cardiology where we can actually take advantage, I'm sorry, of cancer, cardio-oncology. So we are treating now a lot of, we're seeing a lot of younger, I have a, we, we created the cardio-oncology group uh, a few years ago, and many other uh, hospital institutions are doing that. That's a great opportunity to work together with, uh, uh, with cancer, and actually, taking away advantage for cardiovascular uh, uh, related issues, uh, this relationship. And those are young patients, not mentioning congenital heart disease. When we say 80% is preventable, it means that, okay, the 20% are usually uh, congenital heart disease, but in the 80% that are uh, uh, preventable is along the whole lifespan. 
It's not only for the 80 or the 90 years old. And I will reinforce, and I totally agree with the concepts that were mentioned here regarding discrimination. And of course, you know, if it's about other discrimination uh, ways, we will be very offended. Age, sometimes the, the, the community kind of accepts, you know, he had a good life, he or she had a good life. So, but that's again, we, okay. we can use this type of uh, uh, arguments. But I think the main thing here is to uh, uh, rule out this perception that cardiovascular disease is only for old age. That's not correct. And unfortunately, because the, the, the prevalence of disease is increasing, the prevalence of risk factors is actually increasing. The fact is that we have younger and younger patients being affected by cardiovascular disease, preventable. Excellent. Can we say a warm round of applause for our fantastic panel?